RNA interference or RNAi is a really cool regulatory mechanism that organisms use to control the levels of proteins in a sequence specific manner. And it does this by regulating the level of messenger RNAs and the translation from those messenger RNAs. At its heart is an argonaut or agoprotein, and it gets instructed which messenger RNAs to target based on the sequence of a small RNA, so this can be a microRNA or an siRNA, that the agoprotein binds to. Um, this protein acts, this small RNA acts as a guide to direct the argonaut or agoprotein to the messenger RNA, leading to its degradation and or translational repression, and subsequently a decrease in the corresponding protein. Because this is sequence specific, it's a very powerful tool, both in our bodies using it to regulate the majority of our messenger RNAs, as well as in the laboratory and even in the clinic. And so today I want to tell you a little bit more about how all of this works, um, what RNAi is, what it isn't, um, and the molecules involved. So let's start with this argonaut or ego protein, um, which is the protein that I study with my, um, for my PhD work. Um, so, ego binds to a small RNA, and this can be a microRNA or an siRNA. Um, we'll get into the differences between those later. Um, but this forms the core RNA induced silencing complex or risk. These small RNAs are around 22 nucleotides long, and at their five prime ends, they have a six to eight nucleotide long seed sequence that allows EGO to use them as guides to find and bind to messenger RNA targets that contain complementarity to the seed sequence um, and variable amounts of downstream complementarity. These sites are typically located in the three prime untranslated region, the three prime UTR of the messenger RNA targets. And upon binding, EGO is um, able to, alone with the help of cofactors, induce translational repression and or mRNA degradation in ways that we'll get into. The end result is that less of the corresponding protein is made, and then the target can be released. Now, the core risk complex, EGO plus guide, is incredibly stable. It has a half-life of weeks, so the target can get released without interrupting this core risk. So now this um, risk complex is capable of um, seeking out additional targets to repress. So this gives a single risk protein a lot of power to target messenger RNAs that contain complementarity to that small RNA. So let's talk about where these small RNAs come from. So in our bodies, microRNAs are, we have genes for them, just like we have genes for other, um, just like we have genes for proteins, we have genes for functional RNAs like microRNAs. Um, these microRNAs start off um, being transcribed in the nucleus as long precursor hairpins called primary microRNAs. Um, these need a couple processing steps in order to become uh, mature microRNAs. So the first processing steps happen in the nucleus. A complex called microprocessor is going to bind to that um, and cleave it off into a long hairpin. Still not a microRNA, but it's getting closer. Now we have a pre-microRNA, and this is going to get exported into the cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm, it's going to meet another um, nuclease. It's going to meet dicer. Um, and so this is also the point at which double-stranded RNA precursors can come in to act um, double-stranded RNA can come in to act as precursors for small interfering RNA, siRNAs. So, in, so in plants and invertebrates um, and um, use this as an antiviral defense mechanism. So they can actually use um, viral double-stranded RNA in order to produce siRNAs that target viral sequences. Um, so this is really cool, but um, mammals, we've evolved more complex um, immune systems and typically we don't use siRNAs to any great extent for this antiviral purpose. However, we can, um, our bodies are capable of producing um, mature siRNAs from these pr from precursors that are introduced exogenously. Um, so this is a, so from outside. Um, so like in a laboratory, we can introduce siRNA duplexes or um, hairpin RNAs in order to get the cells, um, get dicer to cut them into mature siRNAs that we can use to target and like knock down the expression of um, genes of interest because of that sequence specific manner. So it's a really powerful experimental tool, as well as um, 
it can be used therapeutically. Um, and so there are several therapeutic um, RNAi based drugs in the market. I'll show you one of them later. Um, but either of these, any of these precursors get loaded into the same protein, DICER. Um, and so DICER acts as a kind of ruler and scissors as one. So it's going to measure off a duplex of about 22 nucleotides and cleave it um, to create an RNA duplex um, with overhanging strands. This is going to get loaded into the argonaut protein to form the pre-risk. Um, so at this point, the the sequence, the seed sequence um, of the microRNA as well as, or the siRNA um, as well as the rest of the sequence is hidden by the second strand, um, the, what we call the passenger or the star strands. Um, so in order to become a mature risk complex, EGO has to eject that second strand. Um, and now we have a mature risk comp core risk complex that can then go seek out um, and bind to messenger RNA targets. So when it finds a target where the seed matches, um, what happens next depends on a couple of things. Um, if, this, if the whole sequence matches, so not just that seed sequence, but the entire sequence, or at least um, the majority of it um, up to a certain point is consistently matching. Um, so it has to be past the point where it's gonna get sliced as we'll talk about. So what this is, what's gonna happen is that if the ego is in slicing competent, then ego can slice the target. Um, so by slicing, we mean that ego cuts the target across from nucleotides 10 and 11 of the guide. Um, and this is going to lead to um, raw ends for exonucleases to chew, degrading um, the messenger RNA. Um, so I mentioned that the ego has to be like slicing competent. Um, so ego, we have, humans have four our ego proteins, ego one through four. Um, our main our ego protein, ego two, um, does have slicing ability. Um, although the other human egos do not, although ego three can slice, um, there's in, um, results coming out that it can slice certain targets when loaded with, with um, short microRNAs, um, but the extent and um, of this usage is not really um, known. But ego 2 is our main ego protein and it does have the slicing ability. Um, however, all that being said, mammals, we typically, we don't, we, are, we don't have perfectly complementary targets. We don't use siRNAs um, to a great extent, at least not naturally. And so instead we have, um, we rely on microRNAs um, regulating gene expression. Um, and so when we talk about animal microRNAs, these do not have full complementarity. And importantly, they don't have complementarity in that central region where you need to have complementarity in order for slicing to occur. Since slicing was important for helping degrade the target, we need additional mechanisms to help explain how ego binding to a target can repress it. Um, and so the answer comes from ego recruiting cofactors. Um, so it binds to a scaffolding protein of the GW182 family. Um, and this is going to bring in decapping and deadenylation complexes. And so these are going to remove the protective ends of the messenger RNA, um, exposing them to exonuclease chewing. So you get mRNA degradation, um, as well as translational inhibition. So stopping the messenger RNA being used to make proteins um, and sequestering um, the messenger RNA. RNAs. Um, so all of these are going to lead to target repression. Ego can then release the target um, and do this again. Um, so you are left with a situation like this, where Ego is going to bind to a small RNA, and this is going to program it to seek out and bind to uh, messenger RNA targets that contain at least that seed sequence. However, there's a lot of messenger RNAs out there. And so how does Ego choose what to regulate and when? Um, and so as I mentioned, this guide is going to help um, direct Ego where to go. And the key way it does so is through the seed sequence. Um, and so, but this lots of, uh, lots of messenger RNAs are actually going to have that seed sequence. So this is good in a lot of ways because this means that a single microRNA can target a lot of different um, targets. So if you want to do, say you have related genes and your body wants to kind of regulate them all at once, it can do so if they all have binding sites for that microRNA. 
However, you often want additional specificity. Um, and so this can be achieved by having downstream additional um, pairing downstream, especially in what we call the three prime supplemental region. So about um, 12 nucleotides, 12 to 16. And this can offer additional um, specificity to help um, differentiate between targets in the same microRNA family. Um, and so the the differences aren't just in the targets, they're also in the microRNAs. And so we have microRNA families where basically they have the same seed sequence, but they have differences in the rest of the um, length of the microRNA. Um, and so in this way, you really get this combinatorial effect where you can have microRNAs of the same family targeting different genes and you can have microRNAs um, targeting genes with um, that all, differentially that all have the same similarity to the seed sequence. Um, so if we want to, uh, one way I like to think of RNAi is kind of like Ego being a self-driving car and you program the address in with the microRNAs. Um, but instead of programming an address in, like go to this, like not like a GPS code, it's more like go to a pizza parlor um, or go to, so you might be more specific, like go to a pizza hut or something, but there's still a lot of pizza huts. So you basically, you can um, have the same microRNA targeting mess, um, many different messenger RNAs and you can have messenger RNAs being targeted by different um, microRNAs. So messenger RNAs often have a number of microRNA target sites. Um, Sometimes they have multiple sites for the same um, microRNA. Sometimes they have um, multiple sites for, they have sites for different microRNAs. Um, so you can really get a combinatorial approach. Um, and the more of these sites you have, typically the greater the repression. And if they're in close, um, if those microRNAs are expressed, especially if they're close together, you can get like cooperative cooperativity. Um, and so that GW182 um, protein, it's really cool. The one that's going to recruit the cofactors it can actually bind to multiple egos. Um, and so you can kind of have it helping hold uh, multiple egos in place. And so if you have um, target sites in close proximity, then you can have them bound and then the GW182 is kind of helping hold them there and helping um, then GW182 is also bringing in those um, deadylation and de-capping um, de um, capping complexes, and so you really get an increase in repression. So there's a lot of cool work being done in this field. Um, and so how we can actually see how this whole like seed and supplemental thing plays out um, if we look at the protein. Um, so if we look at ego and we look at complexes of ego bound to RNAs. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to the structure of ego. So this is ego two. Um, so our main human argonaut. Um, this is bound to a two microRNA twenty mir twenty um, guide. Um, this was this is a crystal structure that was solved in my lab um, by Alado Kayam, who served as a really great mentor for me. Um, and so this in this structure, we can see that ego has these four main domains. And I should mention that all of the ego is like part of an Argonaut superfamily, and they share this core domain structure. Um, it, it consists of four main domains. So there's the N, PAS, MID, and PWE domains, as well as two linker regions, L1 and L2. So the RNA is actually going to wend through a RNA binding channel in the protein. Um, so I'm showing it as a dotted line that the, so the RNA, there's like an RNA binding channel throughout the protein and but part of the protein in the structure is disordered. Um, so there is, pro, the, I'm sorry, some of the RNA in the structure is disordered. So the microRNA is really um, going that whole length, but we can't, um, we can't model in the, um, this disordered region. So I'm just drawing it as a dashed line, but know that the RNA, there's like a continuous RNA um, and it's actually bound tightly at the five prime end um, in a pocket created by the mid and peewee domains. And then it's winding through the channel of the protein and um, binding at the three, the three prime end is binding in the PAS domain. Um, so in our lab, we like to think of ego as looking a bit like a duck. Um, so in this analogy, the, um, the three prime end of the RNA is being held bitten down by the beak of the duck. Um, and then um, the rest of the protein is kind of like serving as wings, helping protect that RNA. So when ego is in this 
confirmation um, when it's bound to a guide. The beginning, the seed region of the guide is actually pre like exposed um, and arranged perfectly so that it can like bind, to, it can kind of move along and seek out sequences, test sequences to see if they have a matching seed sequence. But it's only the beginning part, it's only that beginning of the seed that's actually exposed in um, when ego is in the guide bound stage. You actually, in order to have further pairing, ego is going to have to undergo conformational changes. So it's going to have to, to shape shift. Um, and it does this after you have that initial binding to the seed sequence. So here, that was guide only. Now we have it bound to a short target. So this is like the seed only target. And you can see that you've had movement of ego, especially the PAS domain, um, moving in a kind of, moving with the end domain in a kind of um, hinge-like motion that's going to open up the RNA binding channel. And this is going to allow the RNA past the seed region to kind of like unkink um, and so you can get further binding as well as the channels open more so you can get further binding. Um, and so you're kind of now, you also, you see this, um, that yellow helix, we call this helix seven, and it actually like helps interrogate the sequence and it moves out of the way to help open the channel in order to accommodate um, further supplemental region pairing. Um, so this is like the three prime supplemental region we talked about before. Um, and note that again, we have disordered regions of the RNA, but there really is RNA here. Um, and so you kind of see that you have this organization where you have these like um, helical structures like you would see um, in double stranded RNA. And then you have this kind of like disordered bridge region. Um, and then you have this channels being opened um, to accommodate this. And so, this is basically the structure of ego. Um, and now, so that helps explain how we, it can accommodate the seed and supplemental region pairing and why the seed region is going to be that most important determinant of that initial binding, because that's really what gets ego um, to latch on and open up further. So in the bigger picture of things, microRNA uh, mediated repression is going to act as a post-transcriptional regulatory mechanism. So when we talk about like levels of gene expression, um, so you might like gene expression is kind of this vague term and it can mean a lot of different things. Um, so we can talk about expression being regulated at the transcription level. Um, so how many messenger RNA copies do you make uh, at the translation level? Um, how many proteins do you make from that? And then like at the protein levels, you can have modifications and degradation and that sort of thing. And when we talk about microRNA media repression, we're talking about this post-transcriptional level um, where we're regulating the levels of the messenger RNAs and we're also um, some translational regulation. Um, and so preventing these, um, using translational repression to actually prevent these um, messenger RNAs from being used. Um, but we are not acting on the DNA. And so this is an important distinction between um, RNAi and like CRISPR gene editing techniques. So I like to, um, as I was showing you in the previous slide, I didn't really explain this well, but I like to use this um, bakery analogy where your genes are stored, your permanent recipes for proteins, um, they're stored in the nucleus. Um, and they, it's kind of like a restricted section of the library. And so you don't want to mess with the things that are in there and you can't take them out. So instead you make copies of them um, and these messenger RNA copies are made um, in transcription. And then those are taken out into the general cytoplasm um, where they're used to make proteins um, in translation where ribosomes are gonna travel along those and make protein from them. Um, and so when we talk about these when we talk about different like experimental techniques for modifying protein expression or modifying um, the various genetic information. So it's important to note that RNAi is not CRISPR, RNAi is not gene editing. We are not, inter we are not doing anything to the DNA. So we're not doing anything to those permanent recipes. Um, they're still safe in your nucleus. Instead, what we're doing is we are targeting this messenger RNA. So we're targeting the copies. Um, and since we're targeting the copies, we're not altering the permanent 
instructions. And um, so this is a key difference between RNAi, which is going to use those, um, target the messenger RNAs, and CRISPR. And so what CRISPR is actually going, does is CRISPR is actually changing the DNA so it can make change edits to the DNA or it can actually remove. So we would talk about like a genetic knockout. Um, it's actually taking out um, the gene or at least damaging it in a way that, it, that that protein, its corresponding protein can't get made. When we talk about RNAi, then we're talking about like knocking down gene expression. Um, and so we're not permanently changing the gene, we're just altering the levels of the messenger RNA. But what these techniques have in common is that they're both going to be sequence directed. Um, and so CRISPR actually uses a um, guide RNA, a different type of guide RNA to direct um, this CRISPR um, task complex to the um, to the sequence that to change it. Um, but with RNAi, what that's directing it to the DNA, whereas with RNAi, we're directing it to the messenger RNA. And so these aren't permanent, but they're both important experimental techniques um, that you can use to kind of study what different proteins do. Um, they can also both be used um, therapeutically. Um, and so there are several examples of RNA um, RNAi based drugs. Um, and so, for example, Givlari is a drug that's used to treat acute hepatic porphyria. Um, and so I have a post on this if anybody's interested. Um, but the important thing is that it is actually involving um, RNAi. Um, and so this is really cool. Um, another example, um, so one of the problems with this um, with RNAi though is that it can be you want to need to make sure and one problem is like delivering the RNA um, and also delivering it to the cells that you want it um, to be expressed in. Um, so there are various complications um, with actually getting um, RNAi drugs to work, um, but there's also complications with getting any drugs to work. Um, and so for for this Giflari, for example, it has these um, sugars that's going to target it to liver cells, which is um, important for um, fixing this um, fixing this prop this um, met metabolic um, deficiency, um, and so for helping with this disease. But you can imagine that if you wanted to target to other cells, it could be more complicated. Um, another, so um, CRISPR is also um, being used in some. Um, therapeutic purposes. Um, and so a key example of this is to using it to um, treat sickle cell anemia and beta um, thalassemia. Um, and so there is in these, um, in these disorders, there's a problem with one of the copies, at least one of the copies for, um, so in this disorder, there are genetic problems with the hemoglobin, um, with genes for this hemoglobin subunit. Um, so hemoglobin is the protein that's going to carry oxygen throughout your blood. And so if there's problems with that, that can um, cause the, um, the, the hemoglobin to adopt weird shapes on these like sickle shapes and clump up and cause a lot of problems. Um, this is the complex of multiple subunits. And so since the problem is only with one of the subunits, if you can replace that subunit, um, then the hemoglobin will be fine. And it turns out that we actually have a kind of backup gene um, that can substitute for this beta um, hemoglobin gene that is um, that gets mutated. Um, and so this form of hemoglobin, this gamma um, globin is actually expressed when you're a fetus and it has a really high affinity um, for oxygen. So it um, helps the fetus get um, oxygen from the oxygen depleted cells, um, blood of the mother. Um, but it can also, we don't, you stop expressing it. So you stop like making this protein um, early after you're born. However, you still have the gene for making it. And so what this um, CRISPR treatment does is it can actually um, get this protein to be expressed. And it actually does this. Um, well, there's different um, therapies, but um, some target BCL11A, which is actually a different protein that's going to prevent the expression of that. And so if you knock out the breaks and now this can get made um, and replace the subunit. So there are important um, aspects um, for using either of these techniques. Um, 
And this CRISPR, remember, is a totally different system. Um, so it's involving, it's not involving the AGO proteins at all. Instead, it's involving um, these CAS proteins. Um, and I have more on that in other posts. But I always think it's important to make this distinction that with RNAi, we are dealing at the level of the messenger RNA. And with CRISPR, we're dealing with the DNA itself. And although I've been talking about all of these different like uses of like in the lab or in the clinic uses of RNAi, it's really important too to know that microRNA mediated regulation is actually a key, key core conserved post-transcriptional regulatory mechanism that we're using to help regulate the majority of our genes um, and at their messenger RNA levels. Um, and it has that cool combinatorial feature um, where you can target, uh, it's so it's important for like developmental like switches types of things, as well as kind of modulating the amounts of various proteins. And so I think it's really, really cool. Um, and I have studied it a lot, so I'm a little biased, um, but I still, love RNA interference or RNAi, and I hope now you hope you can like, know why.